Good afternoon, everyone. I am sort of hoping or assuming that somebody else is going to start my presentation. Okay, great. So my name is Theo Knanenburg. Uh, I'm going to talk about an ongoing research project where we are uh, trying to identify, using TCGA data, um, uh, mutation hotspots in, in proteins. Here we go. So we had a very nice presentation this morning by Angela Brooks, who um, also was trying to uh, investigate these mutation hotspots, and she had a nice experimental approach to do that. And we are actually using a, a, uh, a statistical approach, uh, uh, basically uh, using TCGA data as well as cancer cell line data to uh, associate with these mutation hotspots that we find. So the actual work here has been done by uh, William Poole, who is a student of uh, Brady Bernard and myself, and we are all part of uh, the lab of Ilya Smulovic at the Institute for Systems Biology uh, in Seattle. Okay, so here we are looking at the uh, drug response of about 900 cancer cell lines to the drug uh, Vemorafenib, which is an inhibitor of uh, V600E BRAF mutants, right? So the mutants that uh, have an amino acid uh, substitution of V2E, uh, valine to glutamate at the 600 amino acid position in the, in the BRAF protein. And uh, these 900 cell lines here are, are divided into four groups based on the BRAF mutation status, right? So on the left-hand side, we have about 800 cell lines or so, which are BRAF wild type. They have a high IC50. IC50 is the concentration of the drug at which about 50% of the cells is killed. Um, so these BRF wild types are relatively resistant to the drug. Uh, then we have a group of uh, uh, cell lines which have a mutation in a hotspot around amino acid 465. Uh, we have a group of, uh, a pretty large group of cell lines which have uh, mutations around the hotspot uh, at amino acid position 600. So these include all these V600E mutants. And then we have a bunch of cell lines which we find outside of hotspots. So we used TCGA data and our algorithm to infer these mutation uh, hotspots. And it is pretty clear to see that the location of the mutation matters uh, in, in this particular case. Um, not surprisingly, the cell lines which have this mutation around the, uh, the 600 position are very sensitive to this drug. So most of these cell lines are colorectal, skin, and, and thyroid cancer cell lines. Now the um, cell lines which have mutations, BRAF mutations, in the other hotspot, um, or even outside of hotspots, are much less sensitive to this drug. But they are more sensitive than the, than the wild types. So with this well-known and well-understood example in the back of our minds, we set out to identify these mutation hotspots across all the genes in TCGA with a decent mutation frequency. So <clears throat> these mutation hotspots in our case are defined as regions of high mutation density uh, on the uh, linear amino acid sequence of the protein. Right? So they can be much bigger, as you will see, than one amino acid. EGFR has been used quite a lot today as an example. Uh, I'm also using it. Um, EGFR is, of course, a well-known cancer gene. It is aberrated in quite a few tumor types. In most cases, it is amplified on the copy number level. However, when you look at the PANCAN11, which is the PANCAN12 minus the lowly mutated uh, blood cancer AML, we find quite a large number of mutations in this gene, and they are distributed, as you can see over here. So these are both synonymous as well as non-synonymous mutations. So there are clearly are three peaks here. These are amino acid positions where this gene is very frequently mutated. But besides the three peaks, you also see regions where the mutations are quite a bit more sparse or where they are more dense. So our algorithm uh, smooths this mutation count at multiple different bandwidths. And then it uses the local maxima of these smoothed signals as seeds for a, a mixture model 
which is a mixture of uh, multiple Gaussians as well as a uniform background distribution. So use an expectation maximization, we then find at each scale the clusters with high mutation density. And then the final step in our algorithm is a, a greedy approach to identify locally those clusters that optimize the archaic information criterion, which is indicated by the red clusters that you see over there. And we require these red clusters to have at least five non-synonymous mutations. We find, in general, that these hotspots that we have identified overlap very well with protein domains. You can see that here for EGFR, and in general, when we look at, at all the hotspots that we have found across all the genes, about 75% of the mutations in the hotspots overlap with protein domains, which from a statistical point is, is very significant. So <clears throat> we think that we have created a pretty robust algorithm to identify these mutation hotspots across many hundreds or even thousands of genes in TCGA, which actually have quite a uh, variation in their mutation frequency as well as in their uh, spatial distribution. So some, some global character, uh, characteristics of these uh, mutation hotspots. Um, of the 15,000 hotspots that we identified in about 2,500 genes, we see that they vary quite a bit in size. They go from, say, one amino acid all the way up to hotspots which are more than 500 amino acids. In that case, I'm not sure if the term hotspot is actually a good term to use. We can also use the, the word cluster. Um, most of these uh, hotspots are between 10 and 50 amino acids. So in comparison, uh, OncoDrive CLUST, which is a method developed in the group of Nuria Lopez Bigas, uh, is confined to a much smaller scale. Their clusters are usually smaller than 10 amino acids, and many clusters or hotspots are only one amino acid. On average, our uh, multi-scale uh, clusters contain between 5 and 50 uh, mutations, which is also a little bit larger than the, uh, than the OncoDrive clusters. However, in general, we do find clusters at the same locations. Uh, as evidenced by the fact that 84% of the OncoDrive clusters overlap with the multiscale clusters. Okay, so now our main question in this research project was, are these mutation hotspots functional? And the way in which we try to establish the functionality is by doing these large-scale statistical analyses with relevant data. And I've already shown you uh, the association or the overlap with protein domains and a little bit of the drug response. And if I have time left, I will show some more examples of drug response. But now I, will I want to highlight uh, some associations with gene expression data and with signaling pathways. So the way in which we um, can create these statistical associations between these mutation hotspots and gene expression data is by, cre by basically by making binary vectors out of our mutation hotspots. So for each uh, sample in a TCGA tumor type, we can ask the question, does this sample have a mutation in this particular hotspot? And this way we can create these binary vectors for all our hotspots. So we have a very big binary matrix here, uh, say for one particular tumor type. And then uh, we can do a correlation analysis with a gene expression data set, basically the gene expression pro profiles, which gives us in the end uh, pairwise correlations and p-values um, between hotspots and genes. <clears throat> so for this, we use our uh, pairwise statistical test engine that also underlies Regulome Explorer, which is a tool that some of you uh, might be familiar with. Okay, I will just highlight briefly uh, two examples. This is a thing which we find quite frequently. So this is an example in the TCGA endometrial cancer, UCEC. Um, so we see that there's a, there's a slightly stronger association when you look at a hotspot versus looking at all mutations in the gene. This particular case, the expression levels of this gene, CAMK2B, are lower in the KRAS mutants, the 51 KRAS mutants, compared to the wild type. However, when we, we then focus on the KRAS hotspot, which is around amino acids 12 and 13, we find 
a slightly stronger association. Right? And this is a thing that we find, find a lot. What we find much less frequently, but which is also quite interesting, uh, is where we have a much stronger association when we look at a particular mutation hotspot. So in this case, we're looking at the expression levels of the gene GLIS2, and they are higher for the 24 PPP2RA1 mutants compared to the wild types. The p-value is not very strong, though, so it is a moderately significant. However, if we were then to focus on um, the, the 10 samples which, are, which have mutations in this particular hotspot that we found, we find a much stronger association. <clears throat> so finding these significant associations only in hotspots occurs quite infrequently, 60 cases in, uh, in UCEC. Uh, both in the gene and the hotspot occurs quite a lot and also only in the gene, so we don't find it in the mutation hotspot and in that case. Many of these mutation hotspots only contain a very small number of the, of the samples and you have much less statistical power to detect something. Okay, so let's move now to the, uh, the, the, the next thing that we did, which was look at pathways. So the way in which we try to assess the statistical association between these mutation hotspots and signaling pathways is by taking the pairwise p-values from the previous analysis between hotspots and genes and then using the membership of genes in the NCI uh, PID pathways, these uh, manually annotated cancer signaling pathways, and basically combine the p-values of the genes in the pathway to get to p-values between hotspots and pathways. Now here it is important to note that the p-values of, of the genes in the pathway are not independent because the expression profiles of genes occurring in the same pathway are often quite correlated to each other. So if one were to use Fisher's way of combining p-values, uh, one would get a lot of false positives. So one thing that William did was successfully implement Brown's method to uh, compute uh, the combination of dependent uh, p-values. So we think that this is actually a very interesting contribution of his work, but I will not go into more detail about that here. So let's look, let's look at an example. Uh, in this case, we are looking at uh, the statistical association, with, uh, looking at P10 hotspots and signaling pathways in the uh, TCGA glioblastoma dataset. So here we have a heat map with p-values, where the, the low and significant p-values are depicted in dark red. So and dark red means that there is a statistical association between this mutation hotspot and the pathway, which means that there is a statistical association between the samples which, which are mutated in this hotspot and genes having uh, correlated uh, expression profiles, the genes which are in the particular pathway. Okay, so there are three things that I would like to point out here. Um, one, looking at P10, there are actually 27 samples which have a P10 deletion on the copy number level. So we use this binary feature of homozygous deletions and also ran it in our pairwise calculations. And if you then compare that particular feature to the feature which basically says, is there a mutation anywhere in the gene, we see very different pathways light up. So basically this is telling us that deleting P10 or having a mutation in P10 has a very different functional consequence if we look at the pathway level. Second observation, um, when comparing a particular mutation hotspot over here, we see that the, uh, the pattern is very similar to uh, just having the mutation somewhere in the, in the P10 gene. And although there are many fewer samples in this particular hotspot, many of the p-values are actually more significant, indicating that there is actually a stronger relationship when we look at that particular hotspot. So, and then finally, looking across different hotspots, we see different patterns of pathways light up again. Once again, indicating that it really matters where you find these particular hotspots. Sorry, where you find the particular mutations. In the case of P10, this is quite uh, interesting because these hotspots can be directly related to the protein structure of P10, right? So, for example, the hotspot around amino acid 330 
uh, is in this uh, C alpha 2 domain. And the one here around 170 is basically this TI loop. So one can begin to think about the interplay between structural changes to the protein and what this means on the pathway level. And maybe even beyond on the, the cellular or phenotypic level. And this brings me back to the drug response with only 30, sec 30 seconds to go. So I'm gonna do this very quickly. <laughs> Basically seeing that we have, um, that we see that, in this case we're looking at uh, mutations in, in PR3 kinase. Um, that depending on the drug that we are looking at, we see that different uh, hotspots sensitize to different uh, drugs. Okay, so very quickly summarize. So we have developed a novel multi-scale clustering algorithm to robustly identify mutation hotspots and genes and uncovered many statistical associations between these hotspots and what we think are relevant data sets in terms of gene expression, uh, signaling pathways, and drug response. Uh, we want to take this work, which we have done now on PANCAN11, to all the cancer types in TCJ, which I think is going to be called the PANCAN Atlas. We want to integrate these mutation hotspots in our tool Reculome Explorer, such that the association with these hotspots are available to, to everybody that is interested in querying them, um, and write this up and make it available. Um, once again, William did the work here. I want to thank uh, Brady, Ilya, Sheila, Fjesten, uh, and uh, all the members of, uh, of our GDAC in MD Anderson and ISB, and uh, the organizers for the opportunity to present our work here. If you have questions, now is a good time to ask, but also tomorrow at uh, poster number 57. Thank you so much. Have you um, tried to figure out how different types of mutations within the same gene might affect, like I guess that last part you're showing might be able to distinguish, you know, inactivating mutations from potentially activating mutations that might occur within the same type of gene? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. And indeed, all our hotspots are annotated mm -hmm. with the types of mutations that are in there. Maybe I should have made this more clear. When we consider hotspots, we only consider the uh, non-synonymous mutations. Um, but of course we make a difference between the missense and, and all the other types of mutations and we do see large differences, things that you would expect, such as in, in the, uh, the, the, say the tumor suppressor genes, we find somewhat larger hotspots which are less dense and there are more missense mutations in there. Yeah. Other question? Um, I, so as far as I understood, you so far looked at uh, protein coding sequence, but could you also annotate hotspots along the whole genome? Would that make sense? Yeah, in principle, this algorithm can indeed be applied on the DNA sequence. Mm -hmm. um, and it would be quite interesting also to find hotspots there. The interpretation is going to be quite a bit more, more challenging, I would say, but uh, it, uh, it's definitely possible to apply the algorithm on DNA sequences, yeah. Tilt it up so we can hear you. Okay. There we go. Okay. For the p-values which you had, uh, were there multiple testing corrected? Um, because you had quite a few tests and uh, they were only in the order of 10 to the minus 4 or something. Yes. So you were referring to the gene, ex to the gene expression yes. relationships. Yes. Those were not corrected for multiple testing. Uh, however, we, so the number of genes for which I tried it in this particular case, for this presentation actually, um, it would amount to, I would say, Bonferroni correction of around 10 to the power minus 4. So, so the associations that I, that, I, that I showed there would be significant at, uh, at a family-wise error rate of 1 in this particular case. Okay. And did you look at correlations between uh, these somatic mutations? Because you, you, you have quite a bit of correlation structure in there and you would get quite, quite a few of false positives. Y do you mean in, uh, be between the different hotspots? Yeah, yeah. I think that it's definitely the case that we that we have to be very stringent with with that. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. 
So I just want to thank all the speakers again for this afternoon session. So um, the last thing that we have uh, for today is we have a series of workshops that are starting at 4 o'clock. Um, we have three different workshops. They're going to run twice, so once at 4 o'clock and once at 5 o'clock. So if there's one, uh, two of them that you would like to attend, you have the time. Um, the first workshop is the CBIO portal for cancer genomics, uh, which will be in Balcony B. And session two, uh, or workshop two, is the writing and approvable uh, dbGaP controlled access request that's in Balcony C. Uh, those are up the stairs and around the corners uh, of here. And then the third workshop will remain in this room, um, and that is uh, TCJ Imaging Resources. So we've got about a half hour uh, as they get set up for these workshops, and then we can uh, reconvene for whatever workshop uh, you would like to attend. Oh, wait. And, and tomorrow morning, we will reconvene here at 9 o'clock for session three. And when, and the pancreas AWD will be meeting at 4 o'clock uh, outside, and we will walk over to where we're going. Anything else, JC? Okay, that is all my announcements. Thank you, guys.